the historian's job beyond doing the research, uh, the translations in your case, uh, and getting the facts right, is to weave a narrative and put all of these things together. But I wonder where you think the historian's contemporary, I mean, evaluative voice belongs in all of this. So how do you evaluate as an historian in the present, whether what Alexander did was right or wrong, whether the enslavement or executions or the annihilation in general was justified? Well, I don't think the historian uses the current morality or profess morality of the present and then goes back and looks at history as winners and losers and tries to find victims and victimizers according to present sense of propriety or morality. What I think the historian does is they look at the past when they want to make a moral judgment and they take two things into consideration. Everlasting values that are transcended, it's always wrong to murder somebody. In most societies, even if they do it, they consider it, it's wrong. But And then the prevailing morality at the time. So when you look at Alexander, uh, did city-states in the Peloponnesian or Persian Wars or the Theban Wars, when they lost, were they completely surrounded and annihilated? And the answer is, in two or three cases of, of Athenian uh, exuberance, they were, and the Athenians lived to regret doing that. The Melians, for example, Thucydides makes it clear that the Athenians were pretty awful in doing that. And Euripides wrote a play, The Suppliant Women, that had a lot of reflections on, on the, the destruction of Melos. It was considered a, a stain on the Athenian character. And it was mentioned by others at the end of the Peloponnesian War that they should pay back Xenophon, the Athenians, and annihilate them for what they did. So given them, or you can, what I'm getting at is you can assess what the general morality of the times was and then to see if they were excessive. Uh, the morality of 1945 is different than it is today, but what the Germans did and what the Japanese did exceeds considerably what the British and the, the Americans did. And therefore, you can make a moral judgment, I think. And then you have to, as long as you don't whitewash one particular con uh, power or entity and say, well, they weren't as bad as the other people, but you also have to say, according to contemporary morality, they weren't as bad, but in terms of transcendent humankind, what they did to our sense is repugnant. You can say that without... Uh, condemning them, it seems to me, but uh, in modernist terms, what we're doing now as historians, we're saying that uh, Western civilization sent 11 million slaves to the New World, and therefore they're utterly reprehensible and unredeemable. And you, then you say to yourself, well, a couple of things. The Muslim world, you feel the same thing about the Muslim world. It probably took a couple of million more to the Middle East and never had an abolitionist movement, as did the West. And who was the first civilization to actually free slaves? And why did slavery persist for so long when, and the answer probably was, it wasn't predicated on race until the 16th century. And so that if you were enslaved, people just said, eh, I could happen to me too. It's just bad luck. And so... The, but usually today's historians don't consider things like that. They're just so eager to get contemporary resonance by condemning somebody in the past in simplistic terms. Maybe to see if I understand the position correctly. So an interesting historical project would be to understand how these historical figures like Alexander the Great acted relative to the moral standards of their contemporaries, maybe because this can really illuminate something about history and the figures' psychologies. But it's not so much a legitimate project to judge these figures based on the standards of the present, because that's something like to speak uh, figuratively or colloquially. It's just something to earn brownie points or to get resonance, as you put it. Yeah. And you have to consider that we stand on the shoulders of hundreds of generations that supposedly had some 
greater experience each generation with moral questions and ironed out solutions that were adjudicated, improved on, rejected, discussed. But we got to the point where we decided that enslaving somebody was wrong, or we got to the point where infanticide, infanticide was wrong. But we have to keep this I, I think it's very important for the historian to be have humility. So I don't know what a historian 50 years is going to say when they look at the streets of uh, the major cities of America. They're going to say something happened, oh, after 2015, 20, where a million people began defecating, fornicating, injecting, urinating in the very down streets on the public space without a home, and people just... Innocent, they, it was like a medieval city, awful excrement. No one cared. They just did it. What kind of society allows that to happen? Or when the pro-abortion people say, well, I mean, it's reasonable to consider, say, eight or nine weeks. Uh, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's reasonable to consider eight or nine weeks a ban on abortion, but let's say 15. But the pro-abortion stance says, well, there's only eight or 9,000 out of a million abortions that are uh, partial birth abortions. Very small. But maybe a future generation will say, wait a minute. At the zenith of American civilization, there was eight to 10,000 babies who went through the birth canal and were breathing and would have been viable in a second or two longer. And you executed them. So what I'm getting at is I don't have the answers of what they will say, but... <laughs> 